and also from Wolfgang uh, from German Red Cross. Over to you, William. Thank you very much, Ayan. And yeah, it's a real privilege to be here and see people coming in from around the world. So yeah, thank you so much for joining. So Miguel, my name is William. Um, I've had the privilege of leading Sphere since January this year. And it's nice to see some familiar, familiar faces online today as well. For example, Vlatko and counterparts of the DPPI. And I've seen you there in Nina as well, fantastic. So for those who, who aren't quite familiar with Sphere at the moment, we're a small team. We, we have seven colleagues based in Geneva, but we're a large community of dedicated, experienced, knowledgeable, and passionate people around the world who promote, train, and direct others in humanitarian assistance so that support is of a certain quality while always respecting the dignity and rights of all. And this community um, includes focal points, and we have about 70 focal points at the moment, as well as members. We have about 50 members, and I want to take this opportunity at the moment just to thank the IFRC for your steadfast support to Sphere throughout the years. Um, without the German Red Cross, for example, this learning event would not be possible. And at the moment, the Turkish Red Crescent is the president of Sphere, so our collaboration is very close. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of the Sphere handbook with, with the four technical chapters based on three foundation chapters. And it's interesting to note that between 2011 and the 2018 editions of the handbook, the word urban went up from 11 appearances to 86. And the terminology of phrases such as camp was used less in favor of, for example, communal settlement. So in 2016, Sphere released using the Sphere standards in urban settings unpack guide part one with part two, which we're talking about today coming four years later. So this training package has actually been around two years in the making. And I really hope that you get a lot out of the guide and the learning, which you can then quickly use in your everyday work. Um, our fantastic trainer, and thank you for introducing us, uh, Aya Yagan, is gonna go into the details in a moment, but I just wanted to highlight by way of reminder, um, the global situation, as well as the overall need for sphere standards in urban contexts. So there are 8 billion people on this fragile planet Earth. We're 55% living in urban areas since the majority shift of rural to urban was in 2008. So by 2050, 70% of an even greater population than 8 billion, they're going to be living in cities, even though urban areas occupy only 2% of total land mass. And this 70% of all people will be will be producing 70% of greenhouse gas emissions and 70% of global waste. And also to note that by 2050, due to poor agricultural practice and climate chaos, the world will have lost 50% of our topsoil. At the moment, we've lost about 33% of our topsoil, half of the main asset needed to grow and sustain life. And as we are only too painfully aware, conflicts are increasing, they're cyclical, they're protracted, and they're so deadly. So this means that as more and more people seek shelter and livelihoods in urban areas, we need to keep up with the demands and with the needs. And in doing so, ensure humanitarians always work closely with the host governments, with town councils and city mayors, as well as have a higher consideration for environmental sustainability, which is the, the seventh standard of the shelter and settlement chapter. I encourage you to reread that um, another time. So starting out as a humanitarian, I often worked in rural areas, difficult to re reach remote locations in then, for example, Southern Sudan, in Brazil, parts of India, and some parts of Africa. Um, it sounds odd, but I was the first white person some communities had ever met. And for example, the first white person seen in some parts um, for more than 10 years. And I remember going to a place in Northern Kenya um, and it hadn't rained for 10 years and I, and I appeared and it just so happened to rain. Um, and they thought it was like a, the desert came to life with flowers blooming and everything. But in the last decade, I've spent far more time in towns and cities, in Dohuk IDP camp, in Beirut, in Pemba, post the cyclone, in Palu after the earthquake and that devastating um, soil uh, eating up of houses the, where the, after the tsunami as well, in Kabul, 
Last year, for example, I was in Odessa for a few times. Rural people have always sought assistance in towns when their crops fail or when armies surge through. We can see this in ancient books, but it is happening now on unprecedented levels. So it's really appropriate that the main case study for the training package um, is in Ukraine, uh, as well as Jordan. So in urban disasters, humanitarians, we really need to know and have the capacity to assess structural damage, to undertake urban planning, to anal analyze urban vulnerability um, and community resilience, to identify and address the, the dynamics of the conflict in urban settings, and so many more that I will go into detail. So with huge thanks again to the German Red Cross, I now hand over to Wolfgang Friedrich. Thank you. Thank you, William, um, very much. And thank you, Aya, for the introduction. Good afternoon and good morning, dear colleagues, also from my side. Um, my name is Wolfgang and I'm working for the German Red Cross in Berlin. Um, as since 2019, German Red Cross is maintaining a dedicated team to support humanitarian assistance in the urban context. It's funded by the German Federal Foreign Office and in German Red Cross, almost 50% of our international projects in the last years are implemented in cities. Uh, urban context is increasingly relevant for all of our work. And because you are here, I suspect that you uh, already know that. Um, urban requires contextual understanding of conflict and uh, complex environments. It requires understanding the urban capacities and for example, who is best placed to cover the needs. It requires good cooperation between the stakeholders. Urban is where localization is really the key to success. And uh, these are guiding principles that you will find in the training. When the Sphere Association offered us at German Red Cross the opportunity to support them in developing this training with an urban focus, we really gladly said yes. We hope that the training helps to close a gap for practitioners. And uh, we jointly developed the training between summer 2021 and spring 2022, including a reference group with colleagues from the Federation from uh, Red Cross, Red Crescent Climate Center, members of the Sphere community and others. So it was really a joint effort. Plus, I need to thank the team from humanitarian partners, namely Matthew Stevens, Jenny Phillips, and Gautam Krishnaraj, who supported us as consultants in the development of the training. Since summer last year, we were able to run three pilot trainings. Uh, subsequently finalizing the training based on the feedback of the participants. And I'm extremely glad to see the training package being launched today. Uh, many thanks again to the colleagues from Sphere who gave us the opportunity to support this initiative. And um, we look very much forward to a joint rollout of the training. Um, Aya, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, William, and thank you, Gang. Um, welcome again from my side. This is Aya Yagan Al Nashid. I am the technical director at Anastation and I'm a sphere trainer. Um, I really like the diversity of today, and I really uh, wish that you enjoy our time today. So before we start, we would like to share some information so everyone feels com comfortable in this environment today. So as you can see, we are recording the webinars because it, the webinar because it's going to be shared on the Sphere platform and also the YouTube channel. The webinar will be uh, informational rather than participatory um, because of the large number of participants that we are expecting and who are re who registered already for this event. Um, anyway, we will provide few occasions for you to engage through the chat. So please be active and uh, look at the chat all the time because we might ask you some questions. We have Tristan and Felicity from the Sphere. They are observing the chat and they are supporting you in case you have any difficulty or you have any questions. 
By the end of this session, we will be sharing a survey to collect your feedback on the session and also understand um, your interest in the upcoming plans because we as a Sphere community and, and the Sphere office, we have some plans to further um, train and establish like initiatives using that package. So it will be good to understand where do you fit and how you would like to be included in these efforts. Um, on a little bit uh, on, on the development of this package, Wolfgang already cited um, the history of uh, the development of this package. Um, so I just want to emphasize that um, it has, it's, it's been like a collaborative effort. And in order to reach out to this package, uh, there has been like two pilots ahead of each pilot. Uh, there has been like multiple uh, meetings, lengthy discussions until we reach the final product, which we hope that uh, you can utilize in, in your context. Um, additional notes I have here is that um, the, the package is very much based and built on the sphere guide in urban settings. We have additional guide for sphere. These are the, the, the first guide, which was developed in 2016, and the second guide, which was developed in 2020. And Felicity or Tristan are going to share the links for those so you can use them as a reference also for you while you are using uh, the package. Um, currently, the training package is uh, provided in English. Um, we hope that there are some efforts for additional languages, but currently it is offered in English. So our goal for the training program is actually to, to the um, to um, help the humanitarian workers and professionals in the development sector, and particularly who are working in the urban environment to implement and to understand what are the factors that we, we might consider when we are applying C standards in the urban environment. And on our objectives today for the workshop, we aim to uh, walk you through the package so you have a better understanding of the content of the package and you know how to use it uh, in your work. Um, of course, you can download the package from the Sphere website, either for use or for self-learning. Um, Tristan already shared the, um, uh, the link uh, from the website and then he can share it again so everyone knows where to upload, uh, to download the package. I'll share my screen. We would like to show you our agenda for today. So this is how our agenda looks like. Uh, we're going to spend two hours today for this webinar. We started with, with a welcome and introduction. We're going through the agenda, and then we will dive directly into the package, mainly focusing on the core modules, which are module one, module two, and module three. We might have a break in between just for people to take some like break and drink some water. And by the end, we will have a wrap up and conclusion, and we will be sharing um, the survey that I mentioned earlier. Okay, so if you download the package from the website, you will see multiple documents and folders inside it. This is the first document that we will share with you and I'll provide the content of each document. So this is basically an overview of the entire package. And this would be a very good opportunity for you to know what are the package content. Basically, we have this document, the course, the course outline as a main document, uh, how to use the participant's guide, the instructor guide, which are provided for three modules, the course slides, which are provided also for three models, the participant guide, the assessment folder, and supporting documents. I hope that you are able to download the package so you can see all these content inside the package. In this document, you will find that we are illustrating the uh, purpose, the core content of each document provided in the package. So the course outline, what is the purpose of that document? It's just a high level overview of the purpose and the content of the package. And these are the document contents. You can find the course structure, the learning objectives, the primary and secondary audience. We will go through that document so you can see what are the key content.
Following that, you will see how to use the participant guide. This actually uh, is a guide developed after the uh, second pilot, and this may be to help the participants uh, contributing to the training to navigate through and to understand how to use the, uh, the exercises during uh, the training. These are the document's content. The third document is actually the instructor guide. This is a folder, and within that folder, you will see multiple documents inside it. And the main purpose of that, um, th this package, it actually provides like a quick reference of information that is needed for you to facilitate the training. And these are the document contents. This, they are organized in this way. And we will go through them so you will see um, in reality how that documents look like. The course slides, these are mainly the PowerPoint slides with all the training content yet you can use while facilitating this training. The participant guide, this is a very important, uh, uh, important uh, files. Um, these files, they are a PowerPoint files and they are developed after the first pilot uh, to organize all the uh, working environment for the participants who are joining online. Because this package can, can be facilitated online or in person. So if you, are decided, if you decided to go for an online delivery, you will use the participant's guide and I will walk you through the participant's guide so you can see the purpose, the sections and how these guides can be used. We have the assessment folder and the assessment folder you would have, you would see uh, two Excel files. We have the pre-survey and also we have the post-survey. So when you are delivering on where you are using the package as a trainer, you can just copy paste the pre and post-survey and design your pre and post survey in any way that you want, like in Survey Monkey or in a Word document or whatever you want. But the questions for the pre post are available in the assessment folder. For the supporting documents, uh, you would see that we have supporting documents for module one and for module two. There you can see additional documents, additional references that we use to develop the content of the core package. Finally, in this document, you would see a training preparation checklist. These, this is mainly for uh, trainers also to be ready and just to check few things before you go uh, and proceed with the delivery of this package. So that's basically the first, uh, the first uh, document that you would see. It's the orientation to the training package. I will share the next. The next file we will be talking about today is the outline. Let me show you the content. So as I mentioned earlier, this document provides an uh, overview of what is the high level training structure, what are the objective of this training package, what are the learning goals, who are the audience, the primary audience of this training package, the secondary audience, audience for further training. On the learning objectives, also you can use these here uh, when you are um, training or when you are guiding or when you are promoting for this package. So these are the learning objectives. And here we illustrated some instructional principles that you might wish to go through. Now, following that, this section is actually illustrating the duration of the training. Basically, this is the core structure. As I mentioned earlier, um, there are three core modules. Module one, which is the humanitarian response in urban context, and that would ideally span for four hours. Two hours are dedicated for lecture, two hours for activities. Module two is basically around fee standards in the urban context, and that would also span for four hours. Two hours lecture, two hours exercise. And the third model is the tabletop exercise. And this course structure here is illustrating the sections and the top sections included in each module. So you will see that everything is organized here. Um, one note on this uh, circle coding, um, the red circle is actually referring to a required activity, while the blue circle is basically referring to an optional activity. In the package, when we go through the models, you will see that some activities are required and we recommend going through them because they are essential for the learning environments. Others are optional depending on your audience and depending on your time.
So this is the uh, content of module one. We will go through them in the PowerPoint presentation when I, when I present it to you. Module two is basically around adapting and applying sphere standards. That's focusing more on the sphere standards and utilization of sphere standards. And the final section is the tabletop exercise. And we will go through that in the last part of our day. So that would be the course outline. Now the third, the third document that you would see in the package. is actually how to use the participant guide. So this document I mentioned that it has been developed based on the two pilots. And the purpose of this document is to guide participants because the package is full of details and it's very informative. And for people with like less um, experience or less exposure to the urban context or to the sphere standards, they might find it difficult to participate or even to engage. So this guide here, we recommend sharing it with the participant prior to the training so they get to know what are the sphere the training content what is the course structure and what sort of activities are embedded in the package and they know how they can interact and they can engage in the learning environment so basically here you can see that when you share this document with your participants ahead of the training you can see that this is the course structure so they can see what are the sections and subsections and they can have an overview of the three modules the second section is actually the course activities here this table is providing all the activities embedded in this package so you can see what sort of activities are embedded in module one what are the key features what is the style of this activity is it like a group discussion is it brainstorming is it um, a voting activity what exactly are the key features for that uh, activity and then working group arrangements and these working group arrangements these are uh, uh, specifically important for the participants to read them and to understand how they can engage, how can they write their group discussion, where exactly, and how they can share their findings and their group discussion with the wider audience. These are, I would say, these are more relevant for the online delivery because it helps participants using the participant's guide documents. If you are an in-person uh, training, um, you wouldn't necessarily need that course activities, the illustration of that activity, but you would like to share the course uh, structure with the participants. So here you can see that this, um, this table is illustrating all the activities in the three modules, and here you can see all the timeline allocated for each activity. By the end of this section, you would see also some additional notes for the participants, it's important to share with the participant that this course is ba based or built on two case studies that they will be working across the whole training. And they will be divided, for example, into groups and they will stay, they will remain in the same group across the whole training. And you will understand why now when I'm presenting. So these are also important points and notes for the participants uh, before the training takes place. So you can share that document with the participants ahead of time. Um, now I would like to go to the first uh, module, which is module zero. Module zero is basically an introduction. Of course, it's part of the training package. Uh, but the core content, the technical content is actually in one, two, three modules. The zero module is actually an introduction and you can change it in the way that you want. So here you can see these slides. Of course, we, uh, we inserted the pre-assessment survey in, in, the, in the slides, so you can share that ahead of time with your participants. Introduction to the course. This is an overview of module one. You will see that all modules are structured in the same way. So for each module, we have an overview of each module, the whole module. And then ahead of each section, you would see that we have an overview of the content of each section. So you are organized and the ideas um, in and the, the discussion points in the training are organized for your audience. Uh, 
Of course, we're starting with an introduction activity and it's up to you to tailor that according to your needs. So this is one of the activities, the suggested activities that you might like to go for. And then we, you have to show the course learning objectives so people are prepared. Who should take that course? Of course, you need to emphasize also sometimes that, um, yes, there are experts joining the training and also joining our platform today, but there are other people and other audience with experience or they might have only interest in the package. That's totally fine. So it's also up to you to define who are your audience um, in, prior to the training. This is basically the training structure. I'll provide an overview of the content of the three core modules. So the module one is the humanitarian response in urban context, which provides an introduction to the urban context, highlighting the importance of the urban context, and then utilizing and presenting approaches uh, and uh, some tools that you can utilize in the design of your humanitarian program in the urban context. Module two focuses more on the sphere standards in urban context. So we are, we're discussing approaches, consideration, challenges, and how you can adapt the sphere indicators in the humanitarian context. The third module is a Cape Town simulation tabletop exercise we, that I will present to you also by the end of this session. So these are the key content of the package. The activity environment, it's super important um, for, for, for you to start and to prepare participants for the activity environment, and the activity environment would be different in the online forum from the in-person forum. In the online forum, you have to use the participant's guide, which I will explain shorter, shortly. In the in the in-person delivery, you might just provide the, the activity environment that you, you plan to do. Basically, if you have a group activities, just to tell the participant that they will be divided into groups and they will be sitting in these areas or in these tables in the in the in-person um, delivery mode. This is the training schedule, so you might wish to update the time for the session before you start uh, your training. So this is basically an overview of module zero. I will start with the first module which is the instructor slides. And I'll show you all the supporting documents also. What you see here is the instructor slide. These are the main slides designed for delivery. Um, you would lie, you would go through all these slides. Of course, there are some essential content and there are some additional optional content uh, provided here in, in, in the package. So it's up to you, depending on the time, depending on the audience, to decide what content to be provided. Also, the package is designed in a way that you can uh, facilitate and you can undertake each module as a standalone um, delivery. So if you decided to go for that, you can use for module one this PowerPoint presentation, and also you will be guided by the instructor, the instruction guide. So here you can see that module one is talking about the humanitarian response in the urban context. We also providing this overview. So you are, you are aware what are the sections that will be covered in this uh, module. And the participants also are aware what are the sections that are going to be covered in this module. So this is a reference for you. Where are you now in terms of delivery? This section, um, starts with uh, case studies because we would like to start like really in a practical way for that package. So the package would start with a case study and this case study is based and built on the war in Ukraine. Now it's up to you to change that if you find that in your context or up to you if you want to change that and illustrate additional examples, it's up to you. So basically here, we, we were starting with an urban response case study, the war in Ukraine. And here's we're providing participant with multiple situation reports across the training. So everything across the training is going to be connected to the war in Ukraine case study. So there is a holistic case study with multiple situation reports. We will have six situation reports. And this is the first situation report explaining the crisis uh, characteristic 
and then we would jump right away into the activities. So you would see that this is activity and all the activities are numbered because when you are using this PowerPoint, you have to use the, uh, the um, instructor guide also. It's a Word document. I will just show you that. But the numbering will help you like align um, all the activities in the instructor guide and in the participants guide. So we're starting with an activity and here after in each activity, you would see a heading for the activity, a dedicated slide for the activity, and then you would see all the instructions for the, for the activity. Now I want to show you the instructor slide, the instructor guide, because this is your guiding document. And I understand it might be overwhelming if you opened it um, without uh, knowing its content. So, okay, I hope that you can see my screen. All right. So this guide is actually for facilitators, for trainers. Um, it provides a lot of instructions um, about the content, the delivery, uh, it provides an uh, in-depth explanation about the activities, and it provides also a thumbnail of the uh, slides that I just showed you in the PowerPoint presentation. So this is the table of content, and this is the content of module one. This is the instructor guide for module one. Ahead of each section, you will see this table explaining what is the content and what is the uh, what is the section uh, about the, the upcoming section what is it about these are instructional objectives and you can see here for each section there is a total time for the lecture 10 minutes the total time for the activities 25 minutes and the required activities would span for 10 minutes and the optional activities between 10 and 15 minutes so you are prepared now here you can see that this is the case study, the war in Ukraine. This is the slide that I just showed you in the PowerPoint presentation. And here we are illustrating for you um, talking points. So you know what to talk about, how to explain that slide and how to explain that activity. And what are your, your notes that could, could help you and could support you while you are explaining. Of course, sometimes we have some additional notes on the case study and on a particular activities. Here are also talking points, and here are some additional information about the activity that this activity is required, and you wish maybe to have a brainstorming activity, brainstorming discussion for that activity, and the core content of the case study you would see here. So this is the content and the text for the case study. You would see it in this column. Now, in the instructor guide, you would see up for each activity, you would see it illustrated in the instructor guide in this, um, in this way. So here is the heading of the activity with the numbering that correspond with the number uh, in the PowerPoint presentation. And here you see that it's required with a red circle. And then you would see the, the time allocated for that activity. Now, for each activity in the package, we provided a comprehensive explanation. These are the slides that are relevant to that activity. So you would like uh, to share with the participants what are the learning objectives for that activity. What are the participants grouping? So you might engage them in one group with plenary discussion, or you might be guided with additional methods. Activity instructions are illustrated here. And then also we provided you with alternative activity options. That's up to you. So for example, you might opt for using um, another case study from another context. It's up to you also. Here are we are citing and we're sharing with you um, some alternatives for an activity participant led case study or comparison between the camp or refugee scenario. Note for the facilitator. We always have notes for the facilitators in the facilitator guide. And most of the time, these notes are built and designed from the, the pilots. So it provides practical uh, advice and practical um, notes for you to take in, into consideration because these are tested and we're sharing the experience with you ahead of, after the uh, pilots. And you can see that after each activity also, 
for the online or the hybrid delivery, we, we illustrated some suggestions how you, would how you would like to facilitate that activity. You might use the Jamboard, the Google Slide, or the Google Documents. So here is the another um, suggestion. Moving forward, we're moving with the activities and we're moving with the slide. So you can see that this is the slide that would come right after the activity. Here you can see all the talking points that you need to consider and to share. Also, if you feel not comfortable uh, working in the urban environment, we cited a few examples for you here just to be guided with and just to share also with the participants. Activity, you can see that here we have an optional activity. It's worth to mention that the optional activities, you, can, you will not see them in the PowerPoint slides because these are optional. If you would like to inc include them, you would add them to your slides, but all the guidelines, you can find that in, in the guide, in this guide. So this is the instructions for the optional activity. Why are urban contexts important? And then you would go for this for this activity. So you can see that each activity is following the same structure, activity type, learning objectives, preparation, uh, how to divide the participants into group, activity instructions, discussion, notes for the facilitator, and notes on the online and the hybrid delivery. That's an optional um, activity. And then we move uh, forward. I'll just go back to the slides to walk you through the content of the slides. Okay. So and through the activity, and you saw all the guidelines and all the instructions are provided in the um, in the guide. And then here you would see why urban contexts are important. And then here we are citing few uh, facts actually, and um, William provided few statistics at the beginning why urban contexts are important. Um, we would like to take your opinion on one thing. Here, this activity is actually starting, um, uh, start asking and preparing participants about the urban environment and why we're having like multiple complexities in the urban environment. What are the challenges? What are the uh, things that you might consider in the urban challenge, in the urban context. So we would like to share with you a question or a poll. Maybe Felicity, you can help us share the poll. Uh, let's start a poll to understand from your perspective, what are basically the complexities, the top three actually complexities that you have experienced with in your context. It will be interesting because we have a good number of participants today. Okay, more people are still answering. I hope that we can share the results of the poll. 
Okay. So mainly we have 65% citing the urban poverty. Yeah inadequate access to basic services, housing and livelihood opportunities. That's one of the top um, challenges encountered in, in the urban environment. We have 55% uh, for the informal settlement. That's the emergency and the informal settlement that we have and we see in uh, many contexts. And then we have the 56% for the environment degradation increased pollution, of course, deforestation, loss of the green spaces, yeah, which is spreading worldwide. So these are the top challenges. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing that. Okay, I just shared the result. Okay. Now let's go back to the slides. Um, here also we are citing an example because we also want to um, show participants um, how how the urban uh, that how the urban community resilience might be different from the rural community resilience. So this uh, we're illustrating here a very uh, interesting example um, in case of emergency or in case of disaster, how the urban community would respond versus how the rural community would respond, and that's also to start to trigger the thinking of the uh, participants of what complexities and how the community resilience, how the community responds, how the community resources are different between the, the two contexts. And then we would start with the learning objectives uh, for this module. So you would see the learning objectives. And then this is the overview of module one. I told you before that ahead of each module, you would see that there is an overview for the whole module and also there is an overview for each section. You will see that in the PowerPoint slides, we, we inserted additional reading uh, uh, links and resources. These are super important to emphasize because um, there's a lot of content uh, for this package that was driven or referred to to these additional reading. And this will help uh, the trainer and the participants to have a, an adequate knowledge about the design of a humanitarian program in the urban context. This is also our uh, navigation um, slide. So we know that here we're starting with defining the urban context section. This is the overview of the section. We have these, uh, these um, content, these uh, topics here to cover. And then we jump again right to another activity. This is activity 1.1, where we are asking participants to find the urban context because defining the urban context is still not standardized. There are many uh, definitions across the world. There's no one harmonized uh, definition. And people might view the urban environment from different point, point of view. So it would be very good to prepare participants um, to understand and to have like a common, at least a common uh, understanding or a common view around urban definitions. So this is one example from the HMP or LNAP, how to define the urban uh, environment. And these are, they, they are like disaggregating it by multiple uh, categories. And also how sphere is defining the urban uh, definition. Um, also, I would say that I would like to share with you additional um, definitions for the urban environment. Also, we, we will share with you a poll to see what would be the most, uh, what, what would you vote actually for in terms of urban definitions from the options that we will share with you. Felicity, if you can share the question, please.
Okay. Okay. I can see that most of the people are going to the last definition. Okay, I think everyone can see the results now. So the first one, the spaces where a large number of people resit and engage in non-agriculture activities, that's a UN definition of the urban environment. Um, the second one is the World Bank definition, and the third one is the OECD uh, definition, and the last one is uh, the sphere definition. So you can see that there's no one uh, one definition for the for the urban uh, environment. Um, there are multiple definitions, and we can use the or we can follow the sphere because it's emphasizing on the density, diversity, and the dynamics that are different uh, in each context, of course. Moving on in the slides, you can see that here we're illustrating also the types of urban spaces because yes, we are talking about like an urban environment, but urban spaces, urban contexts are, are different. Maybe we were talking about like a peri urban areas, maybe we're talking about like informal urban areas. So it really depends. And it's important for, for, the, for the participants to cite that when we talk about urban, you cannot generalize, uh, it, it really depends on the context and the characteristic of the urban uh, uh, place that you are operating in. Um, then a traditional and urban response context. Here we are illustrating like few, um, few dif different aspects between the traditional context and the urban context. So people who have experience in the traditional context can understand what would be the difference, what would be the challenges, what would be the opportunities also. So here we started to also to emphasize and to focus on the needs because we want to start and to um, prepare participants that whatever we are doing uh, in terms of like design or in terms of using SFI standards, our aim is to respond to the needs. So we have to start to include the needs as a, a main topic in, 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 um, in, in this uh, module. So do need differ between contexts? And then we start like kind of uh, brainstorming and we want to understand from participants, how do they see that needs are different or the severity of the needs maybe. Um, following that, um, we are illustrating opportunities in the urban context. Yes, we, we said that the urban environments are complex. Uh, we said that there are challenges, but at the same time, we it's important to highlight that the urban context offer opportunities for the humanitarian actors to make use and to include and to ease their program design. So here we're sharing a list of opportunities. It could be like a diverse community, the livelihood opportunities, opportunities, the banking system, um, the use of technology and other, um, other opportunities. It would be good also to hear from you, from your context, what opportunities um, uh, or, or advantages uh, have you utilized in, in the urban, um, in, in your humanitarian design in the urban context? So also we would like to share that question with you to see what opportunities you have utilized in, in your program design. So the city, can you share the question, please? Yeah. Oh no, not that one. The one before. Sorry, I, only, I can I only see three polls okay. and we've done okay. two of them already, so. Okay, no problem. Maybe you, got, you, can, you can write in the chat, you can write in the chat what opportunities, uh, what advantages uh, that you used in the humanitarian, in your humanitarian response design um, that would support you to design your program in the urban context. You can share that with the chat with us in the chat. Yeah. Felicity just shared the question. Please feel free to share that with us. OK. 
Okay. Cash assistant, yes. Exactly. Behavior, knowledge, local capacity. That's a great asset. Social perception, existing technical expertise, technology. Yeah. Easier access to existing services and infrastructure. It depends on the crisis. Yes. Diverse economy, diverse methods. Yes. Transportation. Right. Media visibility, right. Yeah, exactly. So these are a few examples how we can utilize opportunities in the urban context that could help us um, designing our humanitarian response. Moving forward, of course, there's not always uh, opportunity. There are challenges also. So here we're citing and we're showing the challenges that could be um, illustrated in the urban context. Following that, you can see that there are additional reading links uh, for the participants to be guided with. Moving forward, we have this section, the conceptualizing the urban context. This section, we will start to dig deeper and to go more technical because we are going to start using some approaches and some tools to help participants start to think of a system and how we can design a, a, a humanitarian um, program in the urban context. So this is an overview of that section. And this is the urban humanitarian uh, program design. What factors you need to consider within the program design, of course, consulting the affected population, identifying the needs and understanding the context. And moving forward, we will be introduced to approaches and tools. So here also there is a, a good emphasis on the basic needs and the higher order needs that um, could be taken into consideration. So as per the sphere standards, the basic needs are the food, water, shelter, and health. Whereas of course, in the urban environment, environment you might uh, wish to add additional higher order needs depending on um, the crisis or the disaster that you are operating and leading. So basically, we will start to disaggregate the elements, key elements that would guide participants into an overall design. We're starting with an assets. What are the assets? So basically, we're emphasizing and we're sharing that you might have infrastructure assets, financial assets, natural assets, social assets, human assets, and these are triggers how you can use these assets in your program design. And then conducting a people-centered needs analysis, people-centered approach is very important and it's part of the sphere terminology. And um, this, this, um, uh, this slide is focusing on how we can conduct a people-centered analysis. And then uh, the participants will practice that so they can understand exactly how that is being done. Here, we are also illustrating few examples of conducting stakeholder analysis, because first you would identify um, the assets, but also within the urban environment, you, you would like to understand who is who and who is doing what. So a stakeholder analysis is one of the tools that we recommend to use, and it's, it's embedded here in our package. So this is one example illustrating um, who who we could uh, uh, who we could see in the urban environment that can play different roles and responsibilities. We have the government, we have the donors, we have the local population, we have the media, we have the national actors, and so on. Here we're illustrating another example. This is a very uh, nice example. I really like it. Um, this example, you can see it in the Sphere Handbook also in the latest version of the Sphere Handbook. And this is taken from IRC. Um, this is uh, in Sierra Leone. 
So this is basically a mapping of the stakeholders with color coding. So you would see that uh, stakeholders are grouped according to their category in color coding. And then there are some links and there are some arrows. This is indicating to their relationship because you wish to understand that who are the stakeholders within the, the urban context, but also you need to understand how they work and how they interact with each other and how they influence each other because they will you will understand how to work and how to work with them and how to engage them in your program basically um next we are talking about the assessment and the importance of the assessment of course uh, the assessment types might be a little bit different because we talked about the diversity we talked about the challenges uh, uh and the opportunities we talk about the different system the financial banking system uh the infrastructure the developed infrastructure system that are in the urban context so your assessment assessing the needs in that complex environment is super challenging. So here are some few suggestions about the type of assessments that can be utilized in the urban context. So we have selective assessment and we have the area-based assessment. And then we jump into an activity. Now here, one note on the activity. Some activities have multiple steps. So for example, this activity, you can see that it has multiple steps. So it is recommended when you are initiating any activity for the participants, you go step by step because each step under each step there are multiple guidelines um, the participants need to go through and then so each uh, you can uh, share that step by step you can uh, tell them to work on step one and you can allocate a specific time and then you can introduce step two and then step three I would like to take this opportunity to show you another document here before we continue and this is the participant guide. One second. Okay. So this is basically the participant guide. Again, the main uh, purpose of these, uh, these slides is for the online de delivery mode. So if you are facilitating this training in an online format, these um, PowerPoint slides are going to be very useful for you because this is basically the activity environment where participants are going to engage, record their discussion and share their discussion points. So in this guide, you will see that all the activities for module one, because this is the, the participant guide for module one, all the activities for module one are incorporated in this guide. So you can see that this is an overview of all the activities embedded in this guide. And then you would see all the activities. So the same slide that we, we reviewed earlier in the instructor slides, you can see them here with the same numbering. So you know exactly which activity are we referring to. And this is the scenario. This is the situation report that is shared with the participants so they can read them. Because uh, in the online forum, you might, um, you might separate or you might distribute the participants into breakout rooms if you are using Zoom. So each group, when they are working within their breakout room, within their group, they have access to that document where they have access to the instruction, the situation report, and then they can and here record all their discussion to notes and here they can synthesize that and write whatever they would like to share with the wider group at the debriefing uh, in the main room. So this is the main purpose of this participant guide uh, document and there is a participant guide for module one, module two and module three. This is the activity that we arrived in the first module. So you can see that all the steps here are provided, the situation report are provided next, and then the two slides are provided next. Of course, you can tell the participants if you need to create further slides, of course, you can do that. 
So ideally, these are, would be shared in a Google presentations, so people have online access to that. And it's always recommended if you are dividing participants into group to remind them to note uh, to to um, to vote for um, to nominate uh, a spoken person who can share the screen and then who can illustrate all the ideas and discussion points. So here are the remaining activities for module one. So this participant guide is basically for the participants to use it in the online format. For the in-person format, um, basically you don't have to share uh, slides. Basically you can share um, a flip chart or you can share like uh, a sticky notes and you can divide participants into groups on their tables and just remind them that they would remain in their groups for the remaining of the training and then they can work uh, together on the flip chart. I'll reshare my screen to proceed with module one, and then we would move to module two. This is the activity. In this activity, we want participants to start to map the needs and identify stakeholders, assets. So you can see that step one is focusing on stakeholder identification, needs identification, and then assets identification. And after each, uh, uh, after each activity, there should be a discussion point and some questions for a wrap up. These you can see here are the situation reports related to that activity that uh, the participant should read and work with. Following that, we start to talk about situating the needs in the context. And here we are introducing the system approach and the system thinking. So in the urban environment, because things are really complex and uh, interconnected, there should be a system thinking incorporated in the design, of course. So here we're, we're defining what are the key elements of any system. And here we're showing uh, IRC, uh, ICRC sorry, video to show how the urban services during protracted armed conflict can be impacted. And then defining the systems and citing the elements as stakeholders and explaining that systems are infinite and systems should be context specific. You cannot use one system that would fit all. Now here, the last part of this module is actually explaining an example for the system approaches. So here we're illustrating three approaches, three examples, but we will be working with one approach alone. So we, we will present the best approach, the, social, the society and stressors approach, and the five urban system approach. And the participants will continue working with the five urban system approach. So this is the SPICE approach. That's a presentation on that. And this is the five urban system approach. So you can see that this system is disaggregated into five main elements. These are the space and settlement, political and government, politics and governance, infrastructure services, culture and society, economy and livelihoods. These are the main uh, components of that system. And then we jump right away into an activity so participants can practice using these systems. So here you would divide the participants into five groups. Each group would be working with one theme out of the system. And then you would start the activity. This activity also has multiple steps. First of all, assign systems. You would, as, as I said, you would uh, invite participants to join one of the five spy systems. And then they are required to map relationships that's part one, and then map, uh, sorry, map relationships part two, what needs. So here basically they need to identify the stakeholders within the system based of course on a case study. So you can find uh, for each activity, the case study, the situation report here. Again, this uh, situation report is built on the war in Ukraine case study. So building on that content, uh, step one is actually assigning into groups. Step two is actually identifying stakeholders based on the report development and identifying like subsystems also, and then highlighting and citing what are the needs, what are the assets within the system. 
and then try to interconnect and link these aspects all together. So which assets can be used to address the needs? So here we're, you're preparing the participants to link the system elements, linking the assets and how we can utilize the assets to respond the needs, and then linking the resources and the assets also uh, to fit within uh, the overall program and what type of relationships. Maybe you would create like two-way relationship, maybe one-way relationship that depends on the uh, relationship relationship mapping that they would go for, and then a discussion point, and then an activity wrap up. And here we illustrated one example. That example is actually one uh, example from pilot one. This is how the group uh, uh, identified the, the uh, that's actually for the uh, space and settlement, how they identified the stakeholders and the needs and how they initiated the relationship, how they, in these elements, how they are connected and interlinked together. Following that, there are additional reading. And the final section for this model is an optional section. It is illustrating the complexity in the urban context. You can see here what is the overview of that uh, section understanding complexity, understanding also complexities, understanding risks also, because uh, in any environment associated risk within the urban environment could be different and contextualized, assessing the risks also, and then the communication and information management considerations. And there's also an activity embedded for that section, which is an optional section. By the end of this module, we would jump into a conclusion. And that's the last part of module one. And you would see all the conclusion that you would like to share with the participants. If you are delivering this model as a standalone model, you would share the training evaluation and the post training assessment. If you are not, you just can just simply hide them. Uh, please, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to share it with us in the chat. Because now we're starting with the module two. Okay, I'm sharing the screen again. So as I explained earlier, this model focus on using sphere standards in the urban context. So the first model that would deliver on the first day uh, would focus on the urban um, terminology, all the definitions and the systems and the challenges, complexities and um, opportunities. Now here in this, uh, in this model, we start with um, an overview of the sphere uh, standards. So basically this will help participants with less sphere experience to just have a, a refresher of the sphere standards. So this is your navigation slide to see what sections are embedded in this module. And then we're starting how do needs, context, and standards relate. These are the learning objectives, and this is the overview of module two. So we would talk about defining these few standards, conceptualizing few standards, applying few standards in the urban context, and key considerations, and then finally the conclusion. Uh, additional readings as well. This is our navigation tool. So you can see that now we're starting with the second uh, section. So overview of that section that would incorporate these elements here. Um, here you can see that there's a, an overview of the sphere. What is the sphere uh, philosophy? What are the two core beliefs of sphere? It's important to cite and to emphasize a little bit on the dignity and the right to assistance. Then you would talk about the stakeholders, who is sphere four. Um, these are a few examples of the stakeholders. And also we're introducing the HSP, the Humanitarian Standard Partnership, which are the guided the guides that go side by side with sphere to provide like a comprehensive uh, guidelines for the humanitarian response. The sphere handbook, the structure of the handbook, of course, and then what are the sphere standards? We, we start here to define what are the sphere standards. 
the structure of the standards, how the standards are structured. So this is also a refresher because it's important for the participants to understand what is the core content of the standard. So we're having the key actions, the key indicators, and the key guidance nodes. And then we would go for an example for the standards. And here we are citing one example from the sphere, uh, from the sphere handbook. And then we are uh, citing, we're focusing on the key indicators because eventually we want to have that comparison between standards versus indicators. Because in some, uh, that there is a common misconception that how we can use sphere standards and how we can use sphere indicators. So the main message that we are spreading here is that standards are universal. You cannot adapt, you cannot change the standards. However, in the urban environment, you are, you are encouraged to adapt the indicators. The indicators there is to guide you actually, but you have to adapt the indicators to suit your specific context, to suit your specific needs. And these can be adaptable. And following that, we are illustrating one example. This is one example from Bangladesh we incorporated just to uh, shed light on how the standards versus indicators can be, uh, the comparison between the standards and the indicators can be cited. And then you would, uh, you would uh, facilitate an activity. That's an activity also for the participants. So they can see, uh, they can practice what is the difference between the standard and indicators. And this activity is designed by Sphere and you can find it on the Sphere website as well. This activity can be incorporated in any Sphere training. I use it normally for my Sphere training because Specifically, as I mentioned, there are a misconception between standards and indicators, so you can use this, um, this activity in any sphere training type just for participants to uh, have a discussion and have an idea what is the difference and how uh, um, the indicators can be adapted. Um, this is a very important slide. I also incorporated in any sphere training that I facilitate because meeting the standards, because also there's a misconception among practitioners and humanitarian workers that uh, if if there is a, a, a an indicator in the sphere standard, we have to comply with that indicator. If we didn't comply, we're not doing good in our programming. That's a misconception. And you cannot assume, because if you follow that, you're assuming that everyone have the same needs and every Everyone is equal in their in their needs, and that's that's um, that's not correct. So basically, meeting the standards meet means that you would uh, you would actually conform to sphere standards. You would actually adapt the indicators, and you would actually work and put a lot of efforts to meet the standards sometimes, and to tailor the stand, the, the indicators sometimes. Um, additional readings resources. Now here you can see that we reached that section conceptualizing the sphere standards in the urban context. These are the content for that section. Now here we, we guide the participants why are sphere standards important in the urban context. And here's an example challenge before we dive into a greater uh, activity on how, we, how sphere uh, can be used in the urban context. This is an activity, we jump into the activity, and this activity has multiple also steps. So you might wish to start to introduce that activity step by step for the participants. So here we're providing like a very brief scenario here, and the extended scenario is provided in the situation update number four here. So you would like to share that with the participant. And also just a reminder, this is already shared in the participant guide. So if you in the online delivery, when you share the when you um, divide participants into groups, you can share with them the participants guide so you, they can have access to the exercise instructions. Step one, situation update. Step two, thinking about sphere standards in the context. And then here we are illustrating one of the shelter settlement uh, uh, standards and then discussing how that can be applied in the urban uh, context. What sort of consideration that we need to factor in when we are using that standard. Moving forward, how do we use fee standards in the urban context? Uh, 
here we're putting more emphasis on a specific uh, uh, indicator from the wash sector. So we want to uh, walk with the participants how we can adapt this indicator, for example, distance from any household to the nearest water point. So the indicator is citing this and the queuing time also is citing more than less than 30 minutes so basically how these can be adapted in the urban context and you would see that there's a lot of creative ideas a lot of discussions around like challenges uh, limitations and opportunities and brilliant and ideas that could come up during the discussion this is also a basic activity around how we can adapt the indicators to the urban context. This activity is multiple steps also. Uh, here we're providing two examples. First is the, from the wash sector. The second one is from the shelter section. section. So from the wash uh, section, we provided a participant with the access and water quantity, that popular, um, that popular activity, that popular, popular standard. And then they, their, their mission is actually to adapt that indicator. So they would work within their group based on a given scenario, on a situation report, how they can adapt that wash standard. So that's basically uh, the first step. And then the second step is adapting a shelter and settlement standard, the living space, how they can adapt that into the case study challenge. And then you would go for a discussion. And this is the situation report associated with this activity. Here, of course, additional reading materials. Moving on applying the two standards in the urban context. So we're reaching this section here. This is an overview of the section. Now, this is very, very important because this section uh, starts to interlink all the system thinking, all the mapping exercise and all the mapping activities that participants uh, went through in, in day one from your module one. And now in this, in, this, uh, in this activity and in the upcoming activity, they will work how to, to embed sphere standards across that system. So this section is actually summing it all up in, in the upcoming activity. So it's super important to understand that it's going to be a little bit uh, difficult for participants depending on their level, of course. So you might wish to uh, share uh, clear instructions about the, acti the upcoming activity. This is the spy system approach that has been discussed in module one. So you can just remind participants that we have the five groups, the space and settlement, polit politics and governance, the infrastructure, the culture, and the economy. And you might ask participants also to remain in their groups to work uh, on that activity as per their groups. And this is the activity, of course, it's also a multiple steps activity. So participants should first revisit their system map that has been designed in module one, in day one. And then they are assigned with a specific standard, a specific key action, specific indicators, and specific guidance nodes. So they need to go to the sphere handbook and then read through these all these contents and see how they can be adapted, depending on the group that they are operating in. Revisit your system map. So in their groups, how they can apply the standards, what elements from the system relate to the standards, and what stakeholders and assets can influence that uh, standard, actually. So putting all the pieces all together, basically. And then you, you, it's very important to highlight and to give participants space to explain how they adapted the indicators. What are the factors that they considered when they are adapting these indicators? We have additional reading, of course. Here are a few key considerations, and this we are arriving to the last part of the um, module two. Here's an overview of this section. This is the last activity in this module, which is a peer learning. 
Um, this is optional also, it's not mandatory. If you have time, it would be very good to go through this uh, section because it emphasizes on the key takeaway from this training and particularly from the last exercise because it's a quite, um, I, I don't want to say challenging, but it's, it's not easy to put all the pieces all together. It depends on the context they are operating in, it depends on their experience and their knowledge. But good here, we're highlighting like key lessons that participants might consider when they are working together within their groups, that in the, in the humanitarian response design, collaboration is very important. How do we collaborate with the multiple stakeholders within the uh, urban context? We know that we have multiple actors. We have the government, we have the national actors, we have the UN agencies, we have the international NGOs, we have the community-based NGOs. So how collaboration, at what level could be created? Same for the coordination. Coordination is very important and we know how coordination mechanism can be set for any emergency. So it's really important to emphasize on that. And then the adaptation, how you would adapt and how would you make use of the resources, the local resources, how you would make use of the contextual knowledge and the experience that could fit into your uh, program design. And then you can adapt the sphere and the uh, indicators. These are some final key messages and these are some additional reading. This is the conclusion for the, uh, this module. And then um, this is an overview of module three. Now, if you have time, because for module three, which is the tabletop exercise, uh, you might provide and prepare participants ahead of time. Uh, you might share some instructions for module three to prepare participants, as I said, because it's going to be lengthy and extensive and it has a lot of details. So if you have time, it would be good to, to provide an overview of module three. If you see that uh, you feel com more comfortable shifting that to the third day, that's up to you totally. And then you would go for a training evaluation if you are delivering this module as a standalone model, and then uh, the survey, the online survey, the post assessment survey. Here you can see that uh, we have an appendix uh, that for module two is actually, if you are delivering this uh, model as a standalone model, this appendix might help you. Okay. Before we jump into the third uh, model, uh, if you have any comments, if you have any questions, please share it with us in the chat. For the tabletop exercise, I will show you the instructor guide. And the slides. So we will be navigating through um, these two documents because there's a lot of uh, details in terms of guidelines that are provided in the guide. And there are some essential additional instructions provided in the PowerPoint. Until I share that, for people who are not familiar with the tabletop exercise, of course, the tabletop exercise are, um, are based on scenario that could be provided uh, for uh, any type of disaster that could be like a natural disaster, that could be a conflict, with the main objective of uh, testing the participant's ability to respond in, in that situation. So it's based on a, a real, real life scenario and uh, mainly participants from different departments. They could be at the organizational level or it could be like at, a, at multiple partners level just to understand how they can work together and how can they collaborate together to enhance their preparedness actually. So that's mainly the tabletop exercise. Um, now, let me share my screen. So I'll start with the PowerPoint. Um, using sphere standards in the urban context. This is model three. And this that would be the third day of the training, the tabletop exercise. 
this is the introduction that you would share for the tabletop exercise. Of course, uh, um, ideally, uh, the tabletop exercise would be good for a participant number between eight and 24. Higher than that, it would be really difficult to manage. So the ideal number would span between eight and 24 participants. And for the, all the pilots, we had participants within this range, actually. Um, the tabletop exercise time uh, for the online delivery, um, it could span for two and a half hours. In the in-person mode, we had more time for that. That was, uh, for, that lasts actually for five hours. And people really enjoyed that and they asked for more time because you, when I will explain to you the tabletop exercise and all the details, you will see that it requires a lot of time because there are multiple steps that participants are working with. It's very important to highlight that the exercise is contingent to uh, the participants buy in, their level of engagement, the level of creativity, because I will show you now in the guide, each participant will receive a role. Participants will be divided into groups and each group will have uh, a certain mandate and each individual within the group, they will have a certain role. So there are certain that you need to do as a facilitator ahead of the TTX. From the participant list, you have to prepare participant and assign roles. So if you are delivering the training in an online mode, you would uh, share uh, the list of uh, the roles in the email with the participant ahead of uh, the day before. So each participant know what role they are going to play and how they are going to contribute to that uh, tabletop exercise and which group they will belong to. If you are operating in the in-person environment, you also have to prepare um, like um, some uh, 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 sticky notes or the roles for each participant and you would distribute that uh, a day before the tabletop exercise and I'm again emphasizing on a day before because based on the pilots and based on our experience that would prepare participants and also that would make them uh, excited about the exercise. Uh, participants are going to be divided into four networks in this game. We will have the community network, we will have the UN and donor network, and we would have the NGO network, and we would have the municipal government network. So these are the four groups that the participants are going to uh, be working with, okay? And each participant are going to have access only to their group. So there will not be like a shared discussion among the groups. No, that each participant are going to be working within their groups. I will explain more about the activity environment. Now, this is the exercise landscape. What do we have for this exercise? We will have one a briefing room. That's the main call. Now, this what you see here is for the in online delivery. So the main briefing room is the main call is the briefing room. You would divide participant into four home rooms. That's the breakout rooms, four breakout rooms, community network, UN donor network, NGO network, and municipal government network. So also, if you are operating in the online mode, you wish to prepare these uh, breakout rooms, name them, and tag them ahead of time. And also, for the activity landscape, you, we would have four meetings room, meeting rooms. Basically, these are breakout rooms five to eight. Of course, we would have the community center where meetings run by the community could take place. UN hub meeting run by the UN, NGO hub meeting run by the NGOs and city hall meeting run by the city government. Now, I want to explain to you how the setup would go for the in-person mode. Basically, you would have Ideally, you would have circle tables across the room, and this is what happened to us, what we did for when we tested that in person in Albania. 
we have circle table that for each group and you would print out like in a clear way labeling for each uh, for each table and you would name each table with with a, with a group so we would have one table for community network one table for you and donor one table for ngo and one table for municipal government at the end of the uh, training hall you would assign four another four tables these are the meeting rooms and also you would label them uh, with the names of the meeting room so participants know which room they would uh, go for meeting. That's in the in-person delivery. Now, uh, participants are required, when, when the activity starts, participants are required to submit actions. Of course, the, 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 um, the activity would spam over five days. So across the activity, we will have five rounds and each round represents a day. And within each day, participants are expected to submit an action. Their actions could be a map mapping action, meaning that they would describe what they would like to know about the urban context. Because basically, this exercise is based on a scenario, the Cape Stone scenario. Okay, so you would provide the participant with a scenario, and then they would work within their group on that scenario. So basically, the first action that they might submit is a mapping action because they want to understand who is there, what is the context, who are the stakeholders, uh, what are the needs, what assets do they need, because under this, under this action, they would ask for an information. And facilitators would provide daily brief. There's a daily brief that is written. I will show you now what is the daily brief that is written. Uh, the facilitator ahead of after each day they would uh, provide a daily brief. So these are the type of actions: a mapping action, coordinate action. In this coordinate action, they would request for a meeting. Maybe they would request for a meeting with the government. Maybe they would request a meeting with the community group. Maybe they would request a, a, a meeting with the peers or the working NGOs. In the implementation action, they would describe what they are going to do as per their group, what they're going to provide in terms of like programming, activity, support, what they're going to offer, and they would specify what is uh, their implementation uh, action, and they would share that on a daily basis. Um, these are a few uh, notes on how to submit an action. If an action is approved, of course, the facilitator, the main facilitator, will go around and either approve or deny the action. Actions can be approved or denied. Um, this is the timeline, how uh, the table exercise would go. I will show you now from the guide because that would be clearer. And this is the scenario. I will go to the guide, the participant, uh, the instructor guide, because we have additional instructions for the tabletop exercise that I would like to share with you. This is basically the instructor guide for the tabletop exercise. Of course, we have an introduction, basically sharing with the participants that this is a, a scenario that is built on um, like a virtual scenario, of course. Uh, again, uh, participants ideal number is eight to 24. Uh, it, we're going to go for five rounds and each round is representing a day. Here, what is the purpose of the tabletop exercise? What is the participant's goal? And here on the roles, Ideally, you would have two facilitators uh, working together on the tabletop exercise. The facilitator one would manage the technical platform in case of online delivery. Um, in case of the in-person mode, this facilitator can help uh, sharing the daily briefs because facilitator two, who is the main facilitator, they need to manage uh, in the online mode, they can manage the story, they can monitor the working documents, and they are responsible for approving or denying the actions. In the in-person modality, 
facilitator tool uh, with mainly focus on monitoring the working documents, approving or denying actions, because going around the, the room and approving and reading all the actions, submitting, approving or denying them, it's enough for the, uh, for the main facilitator that will be supported with facilitator one who will be sharing uh, the daily briefs. Here we have an optional third facilitator that could join if available, that would be an ideal scenario. This facilitator mandate is actually to share, um, uh, to emphasize on the use of the sphere uh, standards and the incorporation of the sphere standards in the response. So whenever they're uh, submitting like an implementation action, they need to take it into consideration the integration and the use of sphere standards and how how they would adapt the sphere indicators in their implement action. Uh, of course, here we are recommending that you might uh, set up the Zoom call uh, at least an hour before the TTX because you need to prepare the main room, of course, the four, the four home rooms and the meeting rooms. In the in-person reality, you have to prepare that in person in the room also. Um, this is the exercise flow. Uh, we talked about the five rounds. We talked about the action submission. This is the mapping. And this is the coordinate. And this is the implement actions. Um, example of gameplay. This is an example. Also, it's important uh, to share that example with the participants. This is also uh, a result of the first two pilots, uh, because sometimes if participants are not familiar with the tabletop exercise or facing any challenge with the online platform, it might be challenging. So it would be good to share with them few examples, how they can submit an action, what sort of action they can design and they can submit. So we provided for you a few examples examples to share that with the participants. The exercise timeline, this is how the flow and the timeline would go. Uh, this activity would start with a briefing on the exercise, sharing all the instructions, dividing the groups and everything that would span for 30 minutes, the first 30 minutes. Uh, whenever you have an opportunity to share any instructions a day before, that would be ideal. Then the first briefing would start the first facilitator would share news from Cape City and that uh, briefing, the first briefing would stand for the first five minutes. Now each round or each day would be for 15 minutes. So uh, facilitator one would share the first brief and then participants are divided into their groups where they discuss and where they group, uh, they discuss with their, with their, with their colleagues. Uh, about the news and also the case study. And they have 15 minutes for discussion. Then we would go for a second briefing, the facilitator one share news from the Cape City and facilitator two because uh, as a result of day one, participants will be submitting actions and they are asking for additional details. So facilitator two in addition, in addition to the written brief, they need to provide few uh, answers uh, for the uh, first day submitted actions. And then we would go for the second briefing and then participants are given another 15 minutes to work on day two. Then five minutes briefing and maybe you would put a break because it's a lengthy exercise. And then we would go for the third briefing and then day three, they have 15 minutes, fourth briefing and day four, fifth briefing and day five. And then we would provide the final briefing. And then finally, we debrief and we share learning out of this exercise. This is the basic scenario that, uh, that participant needs uh, to read at the beginning of the exercise. These are the major needs. And following that, this is the briefing script. So facilitator one would be sharing this briefing script uh, in the five minutes uh, slot. So they're sharing, for example, these are the, uh, uh, the inputs. What do we have? We have a drought, we have water stockpiling, we have movements, we have challenges basically. 
This is the second briefing, the third briefing. So we have five briefs, okay? That would go for five days. These are the briefing scripts. And this is the participant's role. So if you are preparing for the tabletop exercise, these are the participant's role. We have, as I said, we have four main groups. So in the municipal government network, one person should be the mayor. This is the role, this is the unique information, and this is the personal concern that they need to act during the exercise. So that would add a layer of reality and also uh, a layer of contextual contextualization to the activity. So each person would have a role. So we have the Minister of the Water and Infrastructure. We have the Minister of Emergency Services. Of course, you would share the roles also depending on your participants number. So if you have less number than 24, you might share few uh, key roles with the participants. Not everything. This is for the community network. You would share also uh, with each person uh, what role they would act in the activity. This is the UN and donor network, and this is the NGO network. And finally, this is the participant email template. If you have, if you're operating in the online uh, mode, you this is the email write up that you can send a day before to participants for their role division. So you can use this email. It's ready also because we use that and we're sharing that with you. And this is the last list uh, for you also to know who is who. This is where you can, from your attendance sheet, you can specify who is going to act as a mayor, who is going to act as the Minister of Water and Infrastructure. So you can allocate their names and their email before you share that with them. And when you share that, it's very important not to share the roles with everyone at once because it's it's it would give um it would give different taste to the exercise not to share the roles like widely because each person they need to act in differently and they might have some hidden intentions so don't share the list as it is with all the participants you have to share with in individually with each participant so for example i would say i would ask for example aya so you would share an email with aya saying that aya your role will be a mayor on the activity on the exercise and then you would share this section of course if Aya is from the um sorry if Aya is from the municipal and government network you could share that uh, box with Aya only and same for the remaining participants so for the tabletop exercise this is your guide uh, how to facilitate that session and also, I would like to show you the last, uh, the last uh, com component in this package. I'll show you one example. This one. Okay. So this is actually one example of the participant's guide. In the online mode, these slides are ready for the participants. So also you would uh, prepare ahead of time. This is the community network, for example. So you would assign who is going to be in the community network. So you would add their name and their role in this slide. So when they work within their groups, they know uh, that they belong to this group and they know who is there also. These are the instructions. All the instructions that we went through are provided here. And this is their virtual space to work on uh, the activity. This is the action description. This is the example. Uh, this is the timeline for the tabletop exercise. And this is the scenario. And this is a map just to show what are the parts of Cape Town um, that they are uh, considering for the case study. So for the action submission, it would be very good to organize it in a table format. Um, so you can see that in this virtual space, people can submit their actions here. For example, they can say that we need more details about the needs of women. 
we can say. Um, there are certain instructions for submitting an action. The actions should be detailed. It should be also the objective of the action should be clear. So the main facilitator can approve uh, the, the action. We have three status for the actions like uh, approved, uh, not approved or additional details are required. So the main facilitator would put uh, their inputs here in the virtual mode. In the in-person mode, they would go around the room and they would tag uh, the actions for each group with the status, either approved or provide additional details or denied. But basically, participants would submit their actions in this format, in this table format. So you can see that this is day one, and they would work out on day one, submitting at least two actions. This is day two, this is three, four, five. And this is also a workplace for them. Of course, they can develop further slides as needed. So this should be shared with the participants as a virtual uh, uh, slide so they can work within their group in their online mode. Uh, and that would bring us actually to the last part of this package that I would like to share with you. If you download the package, you will see that also there are supporting documents for module one and uh, module two. These are uh, content uh, and supporting documents. For example, you would see that the HSS, HSP activity, uh, the standard versus uh, indicator activity that you can be guided with uh, for the session. So this is basically an overview of uh, the package. Uh, I hope that uh, this is useful for you uh, to understand the content of the package. Now I want to take advantage of the last uh, 10 minutes to answer your questions, uh, any comments, any concerns. Please share them in the chat and we are happy to take them over. So I, I think Felicity and I have answered most of the questions. If you just look at um, the very recent one, for example, that one from Hajar, uh, might be quite an interesting one for you to answer with your experience of running the TTX a few times. And how many people to have for each role for that activity? Um, if eight people joined, you have to adapt the TTX. Currently, all the instructions in the TTX are general. There's no specific instructions as per the number of participants, in fact. However, uh, you might adapt that, uh, as I mentioned, so, so if you have less number, you would still divide them into four groups. You wouldn't change the group division. However, in terms of roles, you would pick the most important roles or key roles and that you would assign it to the eight participants that you would have. But the groups, you would have the same group and you would divide the participants equally, I would say for the groups. One note on the community network, that's also based on the pilots. Sometimes the community network, because they represent the community, uh, sometimes that they they are they feel that they are left behind. What sort of actions they might submit? They're they don't receive funding. They are not an organization that could lead programming. They are community members. They need to be heard. They need to voice their needs. They need to be. Uh, their need to uh, their assets and their capacity needs to be incorporated in the design. So it's very important for you ahead of the TTX to uh, share some few additional instructions with that group, the community network, uh, explaining to them that they can submit actions for meeting or maybe to voice their needs or to go to the media to express their needs uh, and the challenges that they're going through. And of course, the other groups should ask for a coordination meetings and meetings with the community group, sharing with them, like listening to them, having like needs assessments, some survey with the participants of the community groups. So it would be good to allocate extra attention to that group because we don't want them to feel that they're behind or they are unable to submit an action. Of course, they still can submit an action, but it would be good uh, to, um, highlight and uh, provide specific instructions for that. 
wonder me oh okay yes there was one note in the facilitator guide uh, mentioning wonder me as one of the online platform that you can use for an online delivery of course it's not like only the zoom so mike is sharing us sharing with us that wonder is not uh, more available thank you mike there are other platform it's called the moral i don't know if you if anyone is familiar with the moral i have uh, been using i used the moral recently and it's a great platform for interaction maybe you can test that also uh, blue jeans also had a free version for business use this is another uh, platform. Thank you, Renan, for sharing that. To share the document link in the email. Yes, Felicity just shared. So basically, you can go to the link Felicity just shared, and then you can download the package from the Sphere website. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, before everyone leaves, we will be sharing a survey with you. Please take some time to answer the survey because it will really influence our next steps and our plan. We are interested to know how you can still engage with us uh, in our next plans. And before you go, really sorry about the inconvenience for the sharing thing. I didn't expect that, but I hope that things work out later on. Okay, welcome. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Tristan or Felicity, were there any like um, like questions or concerns that come up that we can discuss them at the end? I think we managed to cover everything in the chat, but if anyone does have any more questions, please ask, um, or you can always email us. I'll put my email in the chat if anyone wants to email me after the event. Yeah. Okay, that actually, if there are no more comments or questions that bring us to the... Uh, closing of this session. Thank you very much for your contribution, all the comments that you shared with us. And we we were thrilled to have that diverse community joining us from different parts of the world. We hope that you still engage with us in the upcoming training opportunities or TOT opportunities, who knows. We hope that you we can see you all together with us. Thank you very much, everyone. Kristen, just share the survey again. Please take a few minutes to undertake the survey. That would really help us. In terms of plans, we don't have something solid yet, but really that would depend on the survey results. So after you share your inputs through the survey, we would have our upcoming plans that is going to be shared on the Sphere website, of course. So Mohammed, you can see what are the Sphere upcoming plans for this package and the upcoming training, and you can contribute. French speakers. People are asking about the French version. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe at some point later, this could be uh, developed. Yes, as I said in the beginning of this webinar, the currently the package is offered in English. Uh, we hope soon that uh, it could be provided in multiple languages, but currently we have only the English version. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone, for your contribution. Have a very good day.